Welcome to another Downtown Den and uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Cabman who's our chairman in downtown Birmingham. Paul, welcome. Thank you, Frank. Good to be here. Yeah, and I know we've had uh, a busy couple of weeks at downtown and Birmingham's been no exception. What's the current mood of the business community in, uh, in the West Midlands? I think we're, um, we're, we're positive, we're rolling our sleeves up, we're looking at some opportunities. Clearly some businesses are going to struggle and things like that. The political support has been quite interesting without going too in-depth into it, you know, we're still digesting it. Um, and I think it's, it's a national positivity, but certainly the Midlands, certainly the manufacturing and things like that are looking at opportunities. Yeah. We're expecting later today an announcement about self-employed, and I think that's going to be important that he, he matches um, what was given to you know, most workers last week in his uh, Friday statement. Um, but in terms of the general performance of, of the government, what are you making of that at the moment? Uh, I think the Chancellor has done a, a fabulous job. Uh, I'm surprised. I think he's come out and he's been open and he's honest. Is listening to some uh, some of the business leaders. There's been a couple of petitions, you know, the hospitality industry. Alex from the Wilderness has put up a uh, petition forward. I think that was listened to, and I think there's been some good outcomes from that. Boris potentially, you know, has been in the background. He's probably not been as sharp as that. But actually, if you sit and look at his job, the position he's in, the advisors in, he can't go too heavy too quick, but he's got to control everybody. He's got to manage the UK's expectations. It's, it's a thankless job anyway, but I certainly think the Chancellor's done, done an outstanding job. I'm looking for more positivity to come out today, as you say, and over the next few days. Mm. I, I couldn't agree more in terms of Rishi Sunak. I think he's been outstanding. I, yeah. I'll tell you what's frustrated me, Paul, and I think it's starting to get people a little angry now. It, it's this... It seems to me there's still some uncertainty around in terms of when statements are made, there's unclarity. So last night, you know, I think he's been clear up to a point in terms of saying, well, stay home, self-isolate. But then there's a lot of woolliness around. So if you look at the pictures coming out of London this morning, you know, the capital city is still absolutely rammed. People are still potentially infecting one another. And, you know, what is a key worker? There was still some ambiguity around, well, if you, you know, if you've got parents who have split up, can your kids go and visit the other parent? You know, so for me, where Boris is starting to struggle, and I'm not surprised to an extent, it's on that detailed stuff. Because we've always said his strength as a prime minister or as a party leader is his ability to give messages and sound bites, but he's never been known as a detailed person, Paul, and I think that's beginning to show. I think there was some criticism around comments last made last night and interpretations this morning, and I think it was around the single parents and dual, you know, parental ownership of children and things like that. It's a difficult situation to be in, but I think you're absolutely right. I think if you looked at his election, it was all over Facebook, and there was yeah. many, many comments, sound bites, and everything else like that. But, the, you know, Facebook has come forward, offered him the platform to do that. He hasn't taken up on that opportunity. I'm not going to defend him because there has been opportunities of clear messages to come across. He's potentially failed with that. And I would call upon all local governments and ministerial of government, MPs, the more to have clear, concise and, you know, messages that's come out that are consistent. And it's consistency that's the concern, I think. It's a devil mm. in the detail, but let's just be consistent of what the messages are. The amount yeah. of people that's on the streets is in London and is in Birmingham. I imagine it's in Liverpool and Manchester as well, if we go out and look there. And if you, you look at the city cams, which is quite interesting, yeah. all the city cams are picking things up. There's people strolling around. But I've got to be honest, Frank, I don't know where they're going and I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Whether it's this one day, you know, one day, uh, one opportunity a day to go and exercise, that's okay, but I don't see them all going into the city centre and things like that to exercise. And they're certainly not emergency services or critical workers. No. So I don't get what they're doing. Maybe it's time to start, you know, governing who goes on public transport, look at ID and things like that. Maybe just close it down a little bit more. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. 
Okay, if we move on to um, the local situation in terms of, you mentioned political leadership there. Again, I've been impressed uh, with Andy Street's performance. He's been out there. Uh, I mean, he's ubiquitous anyway, isn't he, Andy? But, you know, I think during this crisis over the past three or four weeks, he's been talking directly, not just to the wider community, but to business. And again, I think the advantage there, Paul, is the fact that he's been a businessman himself. He will have appreciated the challenges of retail and hospitality. And I think that's shone through. I think he's, uh, he's not a politician, is he? He's a businessman turned his hand into politics. I think he genuinely understands exactly what the message needs to be and how it needs to be communicated. The interpretation of what Andy's done. I mean, there's been daily, sometimes two or three messages coming out on social media where he's talking around things, he's offering support, he's giving clear, decisive decisions. He's looking at, you know, there's, there's been some communities that have been disagreeing with each other you know, potential some global issues that maybe China, you know, there's been, you know, echoing across here and things like that. He's, he's guiding people, he's stepping, up, stepping all of that out. He's, he, he's becoming a Churchillian style leader at the moment. So what he's saying is getting good, you know, audiences at and it's a good, clear message. Yeah, as I say, I think you've been very impressed. I mean, again, I have to say in terms of in the Northern powerhouse, you know, Andy mm. Street, Andy Burnham and, and Steve Rotherham have matched what he's been doing, really. And I think that demonstrates as well, Paul, something that we've long advocated, which is more power yeah. and responsibility to those regional leaders. Yeah, Burnham has been brilliant. I've watched him a number of occasions. I, I was impressed with him as a, as a, you know, as a PM, and a, sorry, as a minister and things like that. He was leading, he was good like that, and he stepped away from that. He stepped away from mainstream politics to go to Manchester and that sort of stuff. And I think he stepped up another level. It's clear. He's a business leader. He's somebody you can communicate with. You send him a message, he'll respond to it, he'll answer to it. I genuinely think there's about 10 versions of him that's yeah. wandering around. Because he seems to be everywhere doing everything. Yeah. You know, he's pretty good. And I yeah. think the two of them, although they're separate parties, are communicating well and they're working well together. And I think the rest... You know, the Metro mayors are coming together. Sadiq Khan, I think he's, he's very assertive. His message, it's clear message, get off the streets, don't do what you're doing, you know, enough's enough and things like that. And to be fair to Sadiq, he's been doing it probably a week or two longer than everybody else. Yes. You know, he's yeah. taken the national lead, which yeah. is what he needed to do because we're probably maybe a week behind London or a few days behind London. Mm. You know, he had the foresight and he took the ball by the horns and kind of led it and led the, uh, you know, the communication and things like that. So mm. Now, obviously, we're trying our best to, to keep our membership uh, connected and, and do what we can through things like this, but also our online publications and so on. Yeah. Uh, what are you hearing from our members, Paul? How are their spirits? I think um, some of them are, are, are slightly struggling. Some are asking for interpretation and just a sounding board. I've spoke to probably four today, four or five. I've, I'm, you know, I'm on social media, all over social media. There's quite a few bouncing around there. I think for me, Frank, it's our support is for our members. Our members come first, of course, but our message, the information that we're researching, you know, that we're putting out there goes to everybody. So we're looking at the community, we're supporting the business community, we're taking the messages out there. It's positive. We're looking at the opportunities. We are at the end of a phone, you know, the, our, the uh, downtown and business chair people are all at the end of a phone. My number's on my LinkedIn. I'm there. I'm open. If anybody wants to communicate with me, day or night, same number. I don't have a business number. I have one number. Give me a call. That's, uh, and, and uh, you know, what I know by experience, Paul, is that when you get that call, you act, mate. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, it's not just... Uh, a shoulder to cry on. There's some real actions there if, if they need it. So if you're in Birmingham, I'd, I'd really advise you to take that offer up. The other thing, Paul, you're very involved, as we know, with the charitable sector. Yeah. Um, now, I know there have been conversations at government level over what charities need to, what, what need to do to, to be supported. Um, but again, what are you hearing from that sector? I think uh, initial, initially it was just an absolute crisis, wasn't it? If you look at the employability side and things like that, that's fine. But actually, look, if you look at the, the reactive, 
So if you look at Acorn, St Mary's Hospice and things like that, clearly they're going to be potentially overwhelmed. They're under underfunded and, we, and we've gone out there raising money with charitable. We did a fire walk and there's constant things that's happening just to try and keep the edge on the finance side. But the resources side and things like that, you know, that's stretched to the limit. Same as all the NHS, the emergency workers stretched to the limit and things like that. But I mean, I've got strong leadership. They've got an excellent board. Mark Upton's leading the board. Toby Porter at Acorns is leading. You know, we've been mindful, being careful of what we're doing. The three auspices are still functioning. You know, they're looking after people. They're doing what they need to be doing. They're giving advice. They're taking out services to homes and things like that, to Mary's Hospice. You know, we're doing exactly the same and things like that. They're communicating while they're doing that. But I think there's just representation of, of a sector that definitely needs governmental support and things like that. And I've got to say, it's financial support that's needed straight away. They need to buy more resources, be people, be materials, be medication and things like that. They need it now and they need to deliver that excellent service of what they're doing and continue to do that nationally, not just in the, in the Midlands, really. Yeah, I'm sure we'd be echoing that from uh, right across the country, Paul. And yeah, definitely. The other sector, of course, that you've got huge uh, involvement in is education, uh, particularly the universities. They now must be looking at their projections from next year and tearing them up and saying, well, where do we go? <laughs> because, you know, your international student market, uh, for one, is going to be, uh, if it, let's put it this way, unstable. And of course, then you've got your university intake from the UK and what's going to happen to that. So what are you hearing from our universities? I mean, most of, most of them have closed down now and, and everything's gone online and things like that. So they're functioning and attempting to function. They've got the technology, they've got the, you know, the lecturers and that kind of angle. They've taken about a week out just to get everything in place and things like that. I mean, my, my position as a visiting professor is at BCU. BCU is 60% from Birmingham, 20% from the West Midlands, it's about 10% international, about 10% other. That 10% for us is pretty key because it adds to the enrichment of education, you know, and for the students to, to mix and everything else like that. I think it's good for the region as well. I think they'll come back. I think they'll come back in droves. I think the strength will be there and that sort of stuff. For me, my question is, if people are studying now, finishing dissertations, timings, what happens there? We've already seen this year's qualifications you know, for the secondary schools go out, for the academies go out, you know, and, they, they, and I don't understand how they're going to, you know, score everything, look at coursework, look at everything else, mock exams and things like that. I don't think they've nailed this. How do we roll that out into degrees, whether it's going to be affected or not? Are we going to turn a three-year degree into a three-and-a-half-year degree, or are they going to have to work a little bit harder and cram it in and then get, you know, some bonuses or some, you know, consideration for that? I don't know. They, they're dealing with that at the minute, but the universities are working hard. They're still moving forward. It's all online, you know, communication's okay. I'll tell you what is interesting now, Frank, and I think, you know, my, my mindset at the minute, the way we work is going to completely change, isn't it? You yeah. know, we're all working from home. I've worked from home. I'm in, I'm in a, a strange position that I'm employed. I'm a director of a company. I have contract work and things like that. So I sit in various different fields and things like that so i've always had one or two offices or desks to work at or work from home mm -hmm. so it doesn't really bother me so i've done that but i think the mindset of working from home if you can control your workforce you know and i'm and I'm, what i mean by that is giving them enough work and productivity and things like that could potentially improve you know the way we work do we all need to travel into offices mm -hmm. do we all need to you know damage the environment can we work from home can we work with the kids running around and things like that, can we just focus our attentions in another way? Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Some good things to be learned there, I reckon. Yeah, and I think there's going to be a huge change in working culture when this is all over. And I think also yeah. there's going to be a change in mindset if there hasn't already been, Paul, in terms of what we value going forward. So, you know, there was an awful lot exactly. of talk, wasn't there, prior to this crisis about unskilled <clears throat> workers and... You yeah. know, do we really need them? And immigrants, well, you know, you can go home because we don't need them. 
And now all of a sudden, of course, it's those unskilled workers that are at the forefront of this fight. I think uh, I posted something on LinkedIn, which was slightly controversial, and it was and it was along the lines of thanking coronavirus, which is let me explain myself very quickly, and and, and it's not anything to do with the virus because it's a horrendous thing, and I wouldn't question that at all. But you are absolutely right. We, we're questioning ourselves, our working ethics, our morality, the way we you know we value people, what we look at, skilled, unskilled, and everything else like that. And I think we're just looking at what we've got to do. And you couldn't think of anything. On, on a perverse sort of mindset of telling everybody to sit still, not to leave the homes for three months, to actually walk out and appreciate what we've got. Mm. You know, the opportunities, our beautiful cities, our, the people we interact with, mm. you know, our societies and everything like that. We have been potentially ta potentially taking things for granted. Mm. And this might be a good wake up call for us and just see, let's see what happens in maybe six months time when we move forward. Paul, that's a great note to end on. Uh, we are going to be talking on a weekly basis. I'm sure you sure. don't mind visiting the den once a week for us. And uh, and obviously you and I will be talking in between then as well. But great to speak to you today, mate. Lovely to see you. Thanks for your time, Frank. All right, Thanks, catch you soon. Cheers. Stay safe. Thanks, Paul. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.